this week on Vice, we sent Thomas to Albuquerque to check out the new phase of school security. Look at those teachers that lost their lives. What if they had a weapon? They could have protected more of those little kids. And also, we're in the old battlefields of Iraq to see what the ongoing cost of war is when the shooting finally stops. Clearly, children are suffering. People are sick. And if the weapons we use really did cause this health crisis, we need to know this. The world is changing. Now no one knows where it's going. But we'll be there uncovering the news. Culture and politics will expose the absurdity of the modern condition. That little child has a huge gun. This scene isn't uh, really kosher by American standards. I was interviewing suicide bombers and they were kids. This is the world through our eyes. This is the world of Vice. I'm Shane Smith, and we're here in the Vice offices in Brooklyn, New York. And for our first story this week, we go to New Mexico. After the massacre in Newtown, Connecticut, the never-ending battle over gun control in this country reached a fever pitch. Both sides believe they're absolutely right, and no one is willing to cede the middle ground. Since one of the fiercest debates is over whether arming our teachers will make schools safer, we sent Thomas to a place where they do exactly that. Live fire run, eyes and ears, everybody ready? Who would think that I would have a gun? I'm dressed up, pearls on, right, right. minding my business, and you come to get me. Oh, here, take my purse, please. Take everything that's in it. Whoop. Mm -hmm. And then they're dead meat, okay? <laughs> Lily Allen is the principal of New Life Baptist Academy, a church school in Albuquerque with 250 students, 20 teachers, and at least five loaded handguns divvied up between them. I know there are many, many parents that they're so against anything that's violent, but coming to the real world, there's violence here. Okay, who's doing pledges today? Come on, Eric. those teachers that lost their lives. What if they had a weapon? They could have protected themselves and more of those little kids. After Newtown, they realize now it can happen anywhere, but how are we going to prevent it? So that's why we're training our kids. So every student at uh, New Life, um, from the kindergartners all the way up to the seniors, do uh, active shooter training. It's basically like a drop and cover drill. Just instead of preparing for like, you know, a storm or nuclear war, they're getting ready for an armed maniac coming into their doors. Okay, guys, remember when you're under the pew, you cannot stick your head out to be nosy. Because that's called nosy rosy. If you do, the bad guy will get you, and we don't want him to, correct? So I'm more concerned about my younger ones on that. Bad guy's coming. are uh, extraordinarily well trained for a bunch of um, high schoolers in hoodies. My response in high school probably would have just been to like, go feed them. Uh, little people, I need for you to stop talking when you're underneath the pew. That will let the bad guy know where you are if you continue talking, understood? Yeah. Okie dokie. You guys are getting ready to die if you're not paying any attention. Do we understand? Remember, it's always discipline. Always discipline, yes? yes. Let's give ourselves a hand, please. How long has this school been here, actually? This school has been here for 
12 years. 12. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the church has been around since the 80s. Yes. Right? Oh, okay. The church has been here since the 80s. Um, was, it, was it always a plan to start a school with it? or? It was my husband's plan. Uh -huh. Okay, we're getting out, babe. Okay. With this being a private school, uh, I have a lot more flexibility and leeway than, let's say, a public school. But as a pastor and a school superintendent, I've been carrying a gun since I left the state police in 1977. So I'm always armed. That's my job. Lily met her husband in the 60s while he was still a New Mexico State Police officer. After the death of their daughter, he found Jesus, became a preacher, and started New Life Baptist. Despite leaving the force, Pastor Allen never quit being a cop and still runs his church and school with a very coply mindset and sidearm. Is that an actual Bible case? So you're going to get a laugh out of this. The church bought that for me. Oh, really? Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a 45 Smith & Wesson. I love it. Uh -huh. So then if I need it, what the pistol pack and pastor does is he charges this weapon, jam the magazine. Notice I didn't treat it gently. So he closed it, make sure it's tight. Now it's ready to fire. It's hot. Since, uh, since Newtown and, and, the other, and the other shootings that have Bunch. happened, a lot, a lot of it seems to kind of confirm what you guys were doing before. Is there anything that you guys learned that kind of surprised you? 11 years ago, everybody thought I was nuts. And this isn't to be bragging, and now everybody's saying, oh, that guy was a visionary. No, you can see evil coming. I'm not carrying guns, uh, doing security and all, just to be a tough guy. The reason why we're armed is you see what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. I'm not paranoid, I'm ready. So in addition to the uh, kind of regular active shooting training, which um, they, everybody at the school has to go through, there's a program the pastor started where he hand selects a group of upperclassmen, and she calls the pastor's warriors, and they get like basically a tactical cop training, and they do this once a week in a PE class in lieu of like you know climbing ropes or playing dodgeball. Remember now, these are not toys. We're not playing. We're actually practicing. Yes. Okay. So let me have three lines facing this way, please, quickly. Is a student who doesn't do the training allowed to be here as a student? The students have to go through the training. That'd be like a student saying they don't want to do a fire drill. You have to do fire drills or you burn. I'm not saying that they have to agree with our gun policy or like guns, but they, their lack of response would jeopardize the safety of all of my other students. Many, many times, people that are at the facility are going to deal with the active shooter before the police get there. If we have to fight, we have to know what to do. But see, there's a bunch of stuff I can do here. I have him here, Ooh, right in the forehead, right on top of his foot, broke it. Ah! <laughs> Good. An active shooter will keep killing people until they're out of ammunition. But we're not going to sit there and let him just murder us. See this finger? Bend it, twist it, bite it, whatever. Keep it off this trigger. Do not quit. It might seem a little bit extreme for teenagers to be doing that, but um, at the same time, like, like what good did laps or push-ups ever do me? You can yeah. eye gouge him, you can bite his ear. Does it make you nervous doing this kind of stuff? Like, do you, do you like feel like you think a little bit more about like gun violence? At first, I was nervous. I, I didn't want to be one, but then since I learned, it makes you feel safer, like knowing what to do if you're in a situation like that. Bang, 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 bang. Imagine a whole classroom that could have attacked this boy, and many would not have been killed. Because if you have a group of kids that are going to attack, you can't kill them all at one time. Bang, 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 is creating a false sense of security. Randy Weingarten heads the American Federation of Teachers, the second largest teachers union in America. They're training kids to actually be vigilantes. Bam. his eye out. At the end of the day, you cannot substitute for the years of training that armed police officers get. They just can't substitute for that. Let's give you guys a hand. Come on, let's go. Hold up, hold up, hold up. New life on three. One, two, three. New life! There you go. While the efficacy of the pastor's warrior's training may be questionable, the kid's swarm and yank strategy is more of a fail-safe. 
The school's first line of defense is its armed security and equally armed faculty. So these are the teachers. This yes. is the faculty wall. Um, which of these fine people is armed? There's about four of them on there that's armed. But if I tell you, then everyone's going to know who they are. Uh, and they... And we don't want anyone to know. Do they have a background uh, that involves firearms? Or? They have quite a bit of training. Mm -hmm. And a number of them come from their maybe policemen wives or they've been in law enforcement themselves. Mm. Parents can play guesswork and we don't mind because they'll never know right. which teacher has it. Okay. But I will always carry my gun with me. Mm. And that's for the protection of their child because they're worth it. We're in a shooting range outside Albuquerque. Um, Pastor and his security team taking us up here to uh, do a few training drills. Uh, we're all gonna go through the ropes and uh, put some rounds in some paper bat guys. Fire! Lily and the pastor ask their teachers to undergo upwards of six months training before they can carry a gun at school. You ready to fire? Yes. Pull the trigger straight back to the rear. This is well past the 18 hours required for a concealed carry permit under New Mexico law, but it's still just basic range training and gun familiarization, all carried out in a safe, controlled environment. Make your weapon safe and holster! Which, it goes without saying, is a very far cry from the lawless, panic-charged environment of an active school shooting. Do a reload? Did you have to shoot him? Uh, yes. Did you shoot to kill him? No, always to stop the action. Two to the body, one to the head. If he keeps coming at you, one to the ground. <laughs> In discussing the issue of arming teachers, uh, in many respects, it's like a Rubik's cube. Every time you turn it, you come up with different dilemmas. William Bratton chiefed the police forces for New York, Boston, and Los Angeles during each of their worst crime years, and is widely credited for making them the livable cities they are today. Studies have conclusively shown that in moments of uh, high drama, that the accuracy rate of even a skilled shooter declines dramatically. On average, less than one-third of police-fired rounds hit the intended target. And they are ostensibly the best trained in America at the moment. Do you ever worry that, you know, even with all the training in, like, a real situation, you know, faced with a threat, like, your adrenaline would, uh, could kind of overpower your senses? Like, is that ever a concern? No, because adrenaline, it boy can make you do things you've never done before. And especially as a mother protecting a child. So there's In a Instincts will guide your, guide your hand. You bet instincts will guide your hand when you're going after someone's child. Yay! Kindergarten, line up! From a rational perspective, what New Life is doing is probably severe overkill. The odds of dying in a school shooting are infinitesimal, just shy of being struck by lightning. Unfortunately, the debate over guns and school safety isn't governed by rational perspectives. And thanks to the media's emotional over-the-top coverage of shootings when they do occur, what's weird about new life now could easily become the new normal. I think that what's happened is that the Newtown tragedy has affected everyone. By and large, we don't have intruders running into schools. By and large, schools are some of the safest places in America. Teachers have said they don't want schools to be like that. They don't want to have a situation where all of a sudden teachers are wearing pistols on their hips. Being quite frank with you, I think it's a waste of time. I'd much rather my kids being trained on uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Parents that want their kids to be miniature Rambos, good luck to them. Send them to that school. If a person steps in here now and starts shooting, if one of us don't tackle him, we're all going to die. What we try to tell our kids is, okay, if you're going to die, you may as well die fighting. Violence isn't going away. And I know a number of people will disagree with us, but that's something we're going to do regardless if we're criticized or not. We will protect their children. story, we go to Iraq. Now, in the run-up to the Iraq war, it became seen as almost un-American to even question why we were going to invade them. 
there was an almost feverish pitch to avenge the atrocities of 9-11. So we went to war. Now the problem with war is it's always worse than we think it's going to be. It's not manly bullet grazes on the shoulder, it's catheters and colostomy bags and never being able to walk again. And as I found out firsthand when I went there, sometimes the after effects of war are even worse. Now this is what most people imagine when they think of the end of a war. Burnt out trucks, burnt out tanks, the floatsam and the jetsam of battle. One of the first ways that they found out about the environmental pollution was a lot of people were coming in with radiation poisoning and they couldn't figure out why. And then the doctors realized that they were all scrappers. They were coming here to take trucks and tanks and helicopters, all the disused scrap that had been blown up during the war. And then they realized that all of this stuff is actually radioactive. Now, of course, we all know that war is bad, but we don't know just how bad until it's over. Because the weapon systems used in modern warfare have horrific and enduring effects long after the fighting has stopped. In Vietnam, for example, the widespread use of the chemical compound known as Agent Orange, which was used by the American military, created a generation of deformed Vietnamese children that suffer to this day because of its toxic legacy. And an even more recent example of the toxic after effects of war is developing on the former battlegrounds of Iraq. The cities that experienced the heaviest fighting are now suffering through a tremendous rise in congenital birth defects and rare cancers. And the city worst hit is Fallujah. Fallujah was the focal point for some of the fiercest fighting during the occupation. 36,000 of the city's 50,000 homes were destroyed, along with 60 schools and hundreds of mosques. It was some of the most intense urban warfare experienced by the Marines since the Vietnam War. We talked to First Private Ross Caputi, a former U.S. Marine who fought in the Siege of Fallujah and was so affected by what he experienced there that he started Justice for Fallujah, an advocacy group designed to bring awareness to the after effects that are ravaging the region. We had sort of a, a shoot first, ask questions later type policy. There was a new thermobaric weapon that we tested for the first time in Fallujah. It's called the SMA NE. If you fire it into a house, and the first thing it'll do, it'll suck all the oxygen out of the house. And anyone in that house, their lungs will collapse. After that, there's an extreme heat blast that just fries anyone within the general vicinity of this weapon. To create this thermobaric blast, it's suspected that uh, uranium might be used. We tried to talk to the U.S. Department of Defense about this issue, but they refused our request for an interview and declined to provide us with a written statement about the use of uranium munitions in Fallujah. However, in documents obtained via the Freedom of Information Act by the International Coalition to Ban Uranium Weapons, the DOD claims they simply did not record the use of uranium munitions before July 2004. So without much information from the U.S. military, it's been left to independent scientists and researchers to figure out what effects these weapons have had. When you drop these bombs in an environment, what happens is that once that explosion occurs, fine particles that contain metals get spread all over the environment. It will enter the soil, it will enter the water, it gets taken up by plants. People who are in an area that's being bombed, it gets right into their system, and then slowly it exposes them from inside. These damages can be much more severe in a child or in a fetus because they don't have the detoxifying mechanisms that an adult body normally has. As early as 2005, there were reports of birth defects in various cities of Iraq. There was a 50% increase in the families that we studied in Fallujah. That's a huge, enormous jump. My best guess is that the source would have to be from military. There is no other source that I can attribute metal contamination to in these levels. So he traveled to Iraq to visit Fallujah General Hospital and meet the doctors who are dealing with these toxic effects every day. Fallujah General is the largest and most important hospital in the city and has been struggling to keep pace with the rise in cancers and rare birth defects amongst the local population. There's two outspoken doctors here who are talking about the birth defects and the health problems that have been caused by 
uh, the war that happened here. So we're going to go in and talk to them, see what they have to tell us. Maybe you could explain what you see here day to day in the hospital. على زيادة عدد الإصابات سواء في التشوهات الخلقية أو في الأمراض السرطانية لدى سكنة مدينة الفلوجة ونحن نعتقد بأن هناك تأثير مباشر هذه الحرب هذا البحث أخذ نماذج من 25 طفل أخذت نماذج من الشعر وأرسلت إلى مختبر في ألمانيا فكانت النتيجة بأنه وجود مادة اليورانيوم والزئبق والبزمط if you have a, a problem of that magnitude, you have a whole generation that's being affected after the war is over. How do you solve it? If there were these problems from the American forces, the people who are dead, I think they need to be able to help them because there are many people who are dead. According to a 2010 study conducted at Fallujah General, one in every 20 babies born in the hospital had some sort of birth defect. Now that's 12 times more than the rate in neighboring Kuwait. Most of the children here are being treated for a variety of rare conditions, ranging from underdeveloped brains to congenital heart defects. So they have PSD? ASD. ASD. BSD. He's dying. Each one of these forms of congenital heart defects has its own problems for treatment, but the common thread is that they're either deadly or untreatable in Iraq. We can't save the, the, the baby. You can't save the baby, and this this baby's dying. Dying when he comes on the first day. Yeah. And they have a lot of cases of these. In one week, we can collect three, four, sometimes five, uh, just in Fallujah uh, General Hospital. And behind every door, there seemed to be yet another heartbreaking story. And so what does this baby have? This baby have a small BDA. BDA, patent ductus arteriosus. Mm -hmm. He's a handicap, but he's alive. Right. You can't fix it by a surgeon. And can the baby survive surgery? Maybe yes, maybe not. Can you do it here? Absolutely no, not. No, no. The, the family know that maybe did. And after seeing the suffering of all these children, our first question was, is America really responsible for this? So we talked to an award-winning journalist who's been covering the region for the last 30 years. One of the major problems with dealing with a story of this kind, a report, an investigation, is that you can never ultimately prove 101% that it was a particular piece of munitions, American munitions, that caused birth defects, um, an explosion of cancers in the case of depleted uranium in other parts of Iraq. Because, you know, when a corpse is um, uh, open, you don't find a little label saying, you know, this chemical came from the United States. But you can prove that there is an X percent possibility, perhaps 90 percent, that it obviously locks into munitions used by, for example, the Americans. And when you talk to the families that are affected by this epidemic, they've actually evolved from who is to blame and are now asking, how do we fix this? مصطفى جاء قبل الموعد هذا وصار عنده تلف بخلايا الدماغ نقص اكسجين So Mustafa has brain atrophy um, and is it thought that it's caused because of the fighting because of the war نعم لان ما كان عندنا قبل هيك حالات احنا واثنين ثلاثه لحد الان بدت هاي الحالات سببهم او كانوا هم السبب الرئيسي او غير يعني غير مباشر بس احنا يعني نريد علاج Hello. How are you? Well, I am Tariq Alfin with Mani. John Mowlud, other Tafel Abdullah. How did I? I am in the next day, Lector, Atfar. If I got in the other end, the Fatha will add you up the Hara, any Fatha will add you up the Hara. Forget the Shinal Hal, Galwal Hal, and we'll add him so I'm a year. I said. وطبعا ورا العملية يعني صار يعني ما أدري قدرا يعني أو سوى تدبير المستشفى إنه صار عنده شلل تام يعني 
ما نحمل غير الامريكان والله اني ما بدي احكي بالسياسه واذا كمنظمه احنا نريد حل لاطفالنا While the Department of Defense refused to comment on the situation, we were able to contact a senior congressman who has been publicly vocal on this subject and was willing to talk to us. I'm very suspicious that depleted uranium is creating a health hazard for not only American soldiers who are exposed to it, but also to the Iraqi people. And my view is that people don't want to look because if you find something, then you have to do something about it. In 2005, the congressman introduced the depleted uranium study amendment, a law designed to force the government to investigate. I got the amendment passed. It required that there be a report in a year. The report came out and it's two pages. And it says we couldn't find anything. I mean, that's that. I was frustrated by their conclusions. They didn't seriously go out and gather data before they wrote the report. I don't think they've done an adequate job. If you're looking for something, you've got to look where it is. The military is not very interested because they don't want to lose the weapon quality of depleted uranium. And to find out that it's bad for people is not something they want to discover. I take a different view, I think, of as the United States. When we affect something in the world, we have a responsibility for what we've done. I was a physician in the Vietnam War. And I watched the military resist, 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 looking into Agent Orange. And so this is like deja vu all over again. I've seen this before, where the military doesn't want to admit that there is a problem. The long-term effects of war are the things that people never want to talk about. That's the really tough part. And this problem is even tougher if A, we continue to refuse a comprehensive study of these health problems, and B, deny responsibility if indeed it's proven that we did cause them. There's clearly a problem in Fallujah. Clearly children are suffering. People are sick. I mean, we owe it to these people to figure out what is afflicting them. And if the weapons we use really did cause this health crisis, we need to know this so that this never happens again. Mountains of ice are just falling into the sea. We're in for trouble. Indeed. This is where the Soviets tested all their weapons. This is the epicenter of a nuclear bomb. In the last six months, you have 9,000 IED. That's an IED. Once you get someone in, they can never leave. Even police helicopters don't dare fly over here, because two years ago, one was shot down by an anti-aircraft gun. Fun place to live. OK, let's get out of here. 